for Sunday, February 10th, you've found the Georgia gang. Stacey Abrams says the Democrats are coming for America. A Metro congressman retires and Atlanta loses a major bank. Some of the stories up for grabs on the Georgia gang. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia gang starts now. And thank you for being with us on this Sunday. The Super Bowl is gone. Politics are back. And we uh, begin this morning examining Stacey Abrams and her reaction to President Trump's State of the Union speech. Here's Lori Geary to lead us off. Thanks, Dick. The tone of President Trump's State of the Union speech, much different compared to his Twitter rants about Democrats. It was a call for unity that Democrats weren't buying. President Trump called for both parties to work together on several bipartisan issues, including infrastructure, cancer treatments, and reducing the cost of health care. Throughout his speech, while his fellow Republicans cheered, Democrats, many of them women and white, sneered. When President Trump mentioned one of the most divisive issues, immigration reform, the faces of Democrats were stone cold. Most of the people in this room voted for a wall, but the proper wall never got built. I will get it built. From agriculture to health care to entrepreneurship, America is made stronger by the presence of immigrants, not walls. Georgia's own Stacey Abrams gave the Democrats rebuttal from Atlanta. The former gubernatorial candidate blamed President Trump for the shutdown. The shutdown was a stunt engineered by the President of the United States, one that defied every tenet of fairness and abandoned not just our people, but our values. Republican Senator David Perdue, who could be Abrams' opponent if she decides to run for the U.S. Senate, said there was a stark contrast between Trump's speech and Democrats' radical policies that have proven to fail. He made no mention of Abrams in his written statement, Dick. And thank you, Lori. And while David Perdue may not have mentioned <coughs> Abrams, I'm sorry, uh, President Trump did. Uh, he called it out, called her out and said she can't win. He didn't say anything nasty about her. He just said she can't win. So, Theron, is it your judgment that she is definitely going to run against David Perdue? I don't know. I mean, if you watch that State of the Union response, there are many people in Georgia that said this was sort of an audition for her to even be possibly considered to possibly run for president. I mean, for her to get past what has been sort of a response that usually does not go well for Democrats. Or to Republicans. Have and Republicans, too. Um, but to, you know, number one was getting past where the national media didn't sort of talk really bad about her speech. I mean, we all know that she's a wonderful orator, but I really love the inclusiveness of having people standing behind her that look like Georgia, that look like a lot of folks in America. And so, absolutely, listen, she is definitely the front runner to run in the Democratic field for U.S. Senate in 2020. But I think what she's thinking long and hard about, Dick, is whether she continues this national profile for another two to three years to wait until 2022, or really strongly consider even throwing her head in the race for president. Well, I think also, I mean, this gave her a national stage. And if you listen to her speech, it was an introduction to Stacey Abrams. She talked about, you know, her personal story, her parents. She talked about Fair Fight Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, this gave her a national stage and a na national platform. And you think about it, let's Let's say Joe Biden puts his name in the, in the hat for Democratic nominee. What a great ticket this would be for Democrats. And when she really pushed back on this whole conversation that we're having uh, as a country around race and racism. And she was very, very specific about how she articulated that basically racism from anyone in any party is just absolutely wrong. And so she did a wonderful job of sort of um, weaving in sort of Georgia political issues with being totally prepared and articulate about some of the national issues that Democrats um, definitely want to talk about. Phil, I suspect you have a different view because I do as well. Well, I do. Now, obviously, she didn't make any major mistakes in her speech. I had to laugh at the background as a PR person. I thought it looked like the people uh, appeared to be zombies in another room, which was very distracting from her message, just uh, an aside on that. But her message uh, were the usual socialist cliches and bromides, uh, policies that will break the bank. I'm glad there's a debate even within the Democrat Party as to how far people like Abrams are going to be allowed to go with some of this radical, uh, expensive things. And of course, the whining about voter suppression. Come on, you know she's a sore loser. Get off that. Get wait, on to wait, the policy wait. She statements. She did concede. She said she acknowledged that Brian Kemp won the governor's right. race. I you, guess that was a victory. You know, we have winners and losers in this country, and she needs to deal with that. Here's my problem with her speech. <laughs> she painted a very dismal, dire portrait of the United States. 
following Donald Trump, who had just given a rollicking speech highlighting what the economy looks like under his presidency, and it's pretty darn good. And here comes Stacey Abrams with this really just to America's kind of an well, idea. Well, you think we were in a recession to hear her talk. Well, if the, she, only, if the only thing you guys... She said truck drivers are being forced <laughs> to buy their own rigs. What does that got to do with anything? Yeah, you know, what's interesting, Dick, I'm actually going to give the president uh, a little credit. He did make a two-second and a half mention of paid family leave, right? That was his attempt to try to sow some bipartisanship and some willingness to work with Democrats, right? Yes, we all know that the, com the economy is good, but if the only thing that you can come on this show and criticize Stacey Abrams about is basically being too American, having too many people in her the backdrop, and really having a message that I think is very inclusionary of where we know this country is headed. And then to the voter suppression thing, guys, we heard it this week. The Georgia Secretary of State's office is investigating possible voter fraud in a state house race that we just had. So while we try to criticize her for this claim about voter suppression, we do know that there is an ongoing investigation in this state right now regarding voter fraud. That's, what, that's a what a secretary of state is supposed turnout. to do. These are local jurisdictions where there are problems. Abrams and you forget to tell people that. It's the duty of any secretary of state to investigate fraud. No big deal. Well, also, too, President Trump went after, obviously, his key issues, immigration, which is one of the most divisive, which I reported. But also, you can't say it was a two-and-a-half-second bipartisan speech. I mean, when you're talking about No, two-and-a-half-second mention of family Pay leave. Okay, I was but, very clear. But the, on the bipartisan issues, he had several more bipartisan issues that we've probably ever seen from President Trump, and he got high remarks. If you looked at the polls, I mean, America he liked his speech. He mentioned infrastructure, Lori. And how long have we been waiting on infrastructure? Two well, years. We, we, no, we, and, and so, he, so he I'm brought just the women in white to their feet with rollicking <laughs> applause and high fives. <laughs> Listen, what more can you do? The Vestal <laughs> Virgins are right there for the nation. And that's right. Seventy-six percent approval of the State of the Union speech by Trump by CBS News, not a conservative outlet. I give. President Trump that. But let's also, you know, let's not take away what Stacey Abrams was able to do. <laughs> oh, I think, I'm not. I, I think, think she gave it was a speech. It was a remarkable speech. I think it was it was a speech that was very inclusionary. She talked about issues like health care. She talked about job creations. But I think she tackled, tackled the issue of race and racism in this I country. I think people are tired of it. No, people are not tired of it because it doesn't matter what color you well, are. Everybody's today. opposed to racism. Not what, everybody. She doesn't, have, she doesn't have any lock not on every, that not, not at a time when we got people basically <laughs> doing black faces we live in Georgia. I'm from Kansas. Yeah. Those folks out there, they don't know who Stacey Abrams is. And they don't care. And they're going, what's all this about voter suppression? They don't understand any of that. Yeah, but I think they really saw a African-American woman who was given an opportunity by uh, leader Chuck Schumer to basically give the response in a different way. And I do think, and I've said this publicly, I think if Democrats want to win in 2020, we got to do a lot of things differently. And I think this was the start by putting someone up like Stacey Abrams to give the response. All right, we've got to get out of it. We didn't get to the other big political story of the week. We'll try and back into that in just a minute. But uh, first, when we come back, uh, we've got some banking issues in the city of Atlanta. Stay with us. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. And to wrap up state politics for just a minute, we should mention that uh, this past week, Rob Woodall, the congressman from the, the Gwinnett Forsyth area, announced that he would retire just a few weeks into his uh, latest term. Uh, the easy way to describe it is to say that Carolyn Bordeaux gave him such a good race that he figured he'd quit. I don't know. I think there might be some family and personal issues well, I there, mean, too. I think this was all about timing. He had recently lost his dad, which, of course, if you lose a parent, it's a life-altering event. Um, he's in the minority now, right? The Republicans lost the House. He's one of 435. So it's kind of like you got to gear up for another fight and to possibly be again in the minority party. You know, is this really worth it? Is it worth it? To your family as well. It allows, though, for Theron, from a Democratic perspective, it's quite a good deal because it allows, for example, Carolyn Bordeaux to spend two years doing nothing but fundraising and to be a really formidable candidate next time around. Republicans have some good candidates, but who, you know, with, with Carolyn Bordeaux raising millions, you can bet, over the next couple of years. Well, you know, this is absolutely, Carolyn Bordeaux was definitely the odds on favorite to be the Democratic. Uh, nominee for the district. But one of the things that I was very happy to see for Congressman Woodall is that he also said he wanted to come out this early to give the Republicans an opportunity to recruit and have a good slate of candidates that can continue the conservative message in the district. And so I think that was very honorable of him to give them an opportunity.
opportunity to decide if they want to run or not. I, I agree with that, and uh, I think there's, to your point, Dick, some great Republican uh, candidates in the field. In fact, uh, I'm sympathetic to B.J. Peck, the uh, uh, prosecutor who's going after corruption in Atlanta City Hall. If he puts more people in jail, he'll have a great record that cuts across all party uh, lines. But he did post on Facebook this morning, no way, he's not giving up. <laughs> he, he's honored, he, he loves the flattery, but he really wants to get at, you know, supporting law enforcement and going after public corruption. Well, so he does have, not want to be a People have changed candidate. their minds But before. he's stating right now that he's not in the race. But there <laughs> are right. a lot of other names being mentioned. There are. There are lots of good young legislators. Let's turn to uh, away from politics for just a minute. And uh, I think all of us were shocked this week when the merger was announced between SunTrust Bank and BB&T of Charlotte uh, and that the headquarters will be in Charlotte. So Atlanta no longer has any of its big five banks headquartered here. Yeah. The original trust company, which became SunTrust, uh, was the only one. And now we get their, what, wholesale banking or something? Sounds like not the best thing in the world. I think we all hated to see that. These are some wonderful, high-paying, white-collar jobs that we're losing. And, of course, we were the center of banking for a long time. I kind of wish President Trump had gotten on the phone if we could have tipped him off and talked uh, to the leaders of, of both the banks and uh, see if we couldn't have done something else. Uh, North Carolina, I don't know why North Carolina has become so strong. Maybe our Department of Economic Development needs to figure out a, a better strategy. No, it's, an, it's, an, it's the old quirks in the Georgia banking laws where you couldn't uh, have banks in different counties. Right, and, but and we had addressed some of that already in the I legislature. I thought we'd fixed it. SunTrust was the last holdout, and now it's gone really for market reasons, not banking law reasons. But and it is a big loss to the community yeah. because they, they do so much for the community and invest in the community. And now, you know, what happens to SunTrust Park? It's obviously going to get a new name. And then you also wonder how much overlap is there between BB&T and SunTrust? And, you know, how many layoffs are oh we looking boy. at in the future? And I just want to echo what Lori just said, is that SunTrust has been a philanthropic leader in this metro area for a very long time. I mean, when it came to opportunities for the city and state that need a corporate partner, SunTrust has stepped up. So I hope that this new BB&T SunTrust structure continues the philanthropic effort that They've been a leader in for so many years in this region. All right, the Super Bowl, mercifully, is over. <laughs> I, I, I really, it began to just wear me down, and I didn't even have a thing to do with it. Uh, we we ended on a sort of a sour note with a lousy football game. <laughs> I think that was the worst part of the event. <laughs> it was. Well, it was. It was a lousy football game. But I think Atlanta got pretty good reviews. I can't, uh, other than a few Marta hiccups. Uh, and, and huge crowds at the airport, which we anticipate. Right. We didn't really do anything badly, did we? Well, Theron, you know, we give criticism a lot to Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms on the show, no. but we have got to give credit <laughs> where credit's due. It and Erica was, Shields, the police chief. Yes, very well run um, from all the way from the Atlanta City Police Department to the volunteers who got kudos. Um, it was great. And I think, too, Arthur Blank deserves a lot of credit because he really made this also about the history of civil rights. And to yeah. see Bernice King and Congressman John Lewis and also um, Ambassador Young on the field during yeah. the, the, the coin flip, that really said a lot about the history of Atlanta. And then, and listen, Mayor Bottoms did a wonderful job, but I also got to give a big shout out to the chief operating officer, Richard Cox, who, if this had gone wrong, I mean, this kind of would have been at his feet, but he worked with a committee of folks to make sure that not only were people safe, people could get around the city um, efficiently. There was no problems getting into the game. I had the fortune of going to the game. I mean, it was very well structured. Um, and look, you know, there was traffic, but they managed it very well. So big, big shout out to Richard Cox and the mayor for working in concert and with the council members. And as Lori just said, I mean, listen, this was something that MARTA got their act together too. I mean, they had a couple hiccups before the Super Bowl, but during the Super Bowl, the ridership was up. People were able to get on and off the trains, and the bus um, sit out ended just in time enough for us to make sure that we had enough buses to get people around. I'm glad you mentioned MARTA because that uh, was the big question mark, yeah. and, and MARTA came through. And of course, obviously, along with the city, there was state and federal support and help, and uh, there was a lot of law enforcement uh, you could see in the city that's now disappeared. Uh, let's stay on MARTA for a minute because I think our next big event coming up will be the MARTA referendum in Gwinnett County in March. Uh, and apparently now Cobb wants to extend their vote because they haven't decided on what they want to vote on. Uh, there was a poll this week that said that uh, the good people of Gwinnett haven't really changed their minds on MARTA. The poll shows that 48% uh, uh, oppose, 42% support joining MARTA. And Lori, it breaks down just perfectly. Young like it, old don't like it. Black like it, white don't like it. 
it's classic. And it's not surprising, right? And Theron and I are involved in this initiative because, for one, I believe in transit. And I think I've covered the state legislature for so long. And to see Republicans really come around on transit and to see Republicans say, you know what, it's time to invest. And when you have Governor Deal and now Governor Kemp will go on economic development team missions, they bring MARTA with them because they know that these companies these high, with high paying jobs are coming to where transit is available because that's where the millennials But want the to voters be. of Gwinnett have to pass it. They do. Well, this is the tricky part, as all of us know on the panel. It's a special, uh, special election. elections. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, all it's all about, about turnout. turnout. It and, is. and basically, uh, it's trying to get out um, your people, whether it's a yes or no vote. And um, who knows what's going to happen? That, it, poll, that poll probably should motivate the, uh, yeah. the, the yes side. You're, you're absolutely right. And as Lori indicated, you know, we're both involved uh, in this issue to hopefully get it passed. But it's also a quality of life issue. You know, everyone that we've talked to in Gwinnett County, and then we've seen polling that shows that people want to not be in traffic for the majority of their commute. And so it's also an ability for Gwinnett voters to really look at one of the many ways of how to reduce traffic. And so, yes, this poll came out. I mean, if you skew it a certain way towards older Republicans, as you just talked about, Dick, there is still some unreadiness there. But there is an effort going on to really make sure that people are informed and that people will actually be uh, advocated to go out and vote but yes But there's lingering bad memories. We, we, we're going to get into this the weeks ahead, but there are lingering bad memories of MARTA. In Gwinnett County, that have got to be overcome if you're right. going to. Uh, there is get one. Your there is one part uh, uh, that voters. By, are by the look way, the at. ballot item doesn't say MARTA. I know it. Well, <laughs> the ballot <laughs> items are always kind of weird in Georgia, <laughs> but there is one one part, and that is there's far more local control in Gwinnett County over this uh, contract, yeah. and, and so it, it it looks like a good deal that are uh, that it, uh, other areas didn't have. Correct. Okay, we got to get out. When we come back, uh, we will empty my stack of stuff. No, we'll have good stuff for you. Stay with us. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Phil mentioned B.J. Pack, the U.S. Attorney for Northern Georgia, and uh, just we might say that he threw a warning shot out this week in uh, speeches to civic clubs in which he said, come on, everybody, come forward. My best deals are still on the table. Mm. Uh, and then at the same time, the Atlanta Council, th this one sort of, blew me away. The Atlanta City Council wants to, to set up a plan for the city and the council to continue to pay bonuses to good employees after all the legal people have said you can't do it under the Georgia Constitution. What is that about, Theron? Well, I think that, listen, we all know that there were some legal opinions about how you reward people who perform well in their jobs and there was, you know, reports that um, that was a little excessive uh, towards the end of the former mayor's administration. So I think that what the council in, is saying is that for people who actually come to work and who do a good job on a merit-based system, um, they should look at some ways to legally and ethically give them a bonus. And so I think that that's the intent of what the council was proposing. And I think there has to be a standard on how you determine who gets the bonuses and who doesn't. And I think, you know, it all comes from this willy-nilly, ugly sweater contest. Here's <laughs> 5000 for you, 3000 for you, and you get a bonus, and you get a bonus. And so I think there has to, you know, they're trying to set the parameters. Well, you're right. And I think the timing was all wrong to do this. And as for uh, B.J. Peck's... Uh, Civic Club warning. Uh, it, it was a shot at the Kiesel Lance Bottoms administration for not being as transparent as it always touts itself to be. And so I think um, City Council has been stepping up very well and pushing the mayor into more transparency uh -huh. and ethics reform. And so I'm glad that PAC issued turning, that warning. Turning to state news for a minute, after we taped last week, uh, Governor Brian Kemp named Vic Reynolds the Cobb District Attorney. Yeah. Uh, to head the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Phil, I know you like that because gangs is one of your issues, uh, and, and Reynolds has put gangs as a priority. Well, he was really, uh, years ago, the Paul Revere in the state uh, warning about uh, the rising criminal gangs, and he's going to be committed to really transforming that agency into the 21st century and to especially form an anti-gang task force. We were discussing, rightly so, how the gangs are not just an urban problem, but all over 159 yeah. counties in Georgia, and so this is a great pick by Governor Kemp. I agree. And as we taped on Friday, we learned that Stefan Ritter, who is the head of the State Ethics Commission, has resigned that post after an investigation into what appeared on his work computer. We don't know what that is, but he has resigned. And uh, so that agency goes back into turmoil. He'd actually straightened it out and had it functioning. 
Yeah, he was the executive director. And a longtime employee right. of the state attorney general's office. I'm somewhat surprised, but, but he's gone. And then uh, uh, one little hangover from uh, the football protests. Neil Warren, the Cobb County Sheriff, and Earl Earhart, the former legislator, have been uh, released from a lawsuit by one of those Kennesaw State cheerleaders uh, for expressing their opinion. Well, it was a federal lawsuit, and um, they should have been released, and all they did was articulate their First Amendment right uh, to their opinion that kneeling was unpatriotic. In fact, the federal judge, talking about race here, the federal judge uh, admonished the, um, uh, the person, the, the cheerleader, saying, you know, just because um, they're white, race shouldn't have anything to do with this. That was their opinion. Uh, the, the, the attorney for the cheerleader was arguing that they were racially motivated, which was a cheap shot and dirty. And I'm glad that uh, both Earl Earhart and the sheriff were out of that. But Phil, um, I'm really shocked that you didn't talk about how Chief uh, 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 Cobb Sheriff Neil Warren used taxpayers' dollars in his own personal legal defense. I don't. I don't have a problem with that because really? yes, uh, I, I really don't. I think that um, it was a. It, it was a. It was something that had to be gotten rid of quickly. Right. And that's where I, I don't care if counties or cities okay. have a right to do that. I, I remember that when the cab of Fulton at the cab city has and a season ticket holder, right? What's that? that? What, he was speaking as a season ticket holder at Kennesaw well, State Football. Speaking and not as, as a the citizen. Sheriff. <laughs> Speaking well, you know, a lot of us. I thought the sheriff was a full-time job. I, I didn't know you can turn it off and turn it on whether you want to be sheriff or not. Well, you want him to not have any First Amendment rights? No, listen, okay. I, look, look, you and I—we met <laughs> a Sheriff Warren. I just wanted to raise the question about getting using taxpayers' dollars yeah. to pay for your personal legal defense. You've got to, you know, you've got to protect these these people, especially law enforcement people, from these frivolous lawsuits. Okay. Right, we haven't said much about the legislature, and there's a reason for that. They're off to a slow start because of the Super Bowl. There were a lot of days yeah. of work lost there, effectively, and there are a lot of small. Bills moving their way through, and we'll get to them as we uh, as we continue on future broadcasts. But for right now, we're going to take a break and come back with winners and losers. Time now for the week's winners and losers. And before we turn to winners and losers, we need to make a brief mention of the fact that uh, Governor Brian Kemp made good on one of his campaign. I'm going to say it was a promise campaign suggestions that uh, the state of Georgia apply for Medicaid waivers to extend Medicaid to more people. You agree with that? It, it's a big shift yeah. um, for Republicans, and they're they're really digging in deep. And it really was a campaign promise to the rural voters of Georgia who are doing without without health care. And it's helped for rural hospitals, I believe. It's Absolutely. a big factor. Well, I think it will lower costs. It's not a shift uh, in, in the Republican Party. In fact, Vice President Pence, when he was governor of Indiana, actually did one of these waivers. Well, it was a big shift from what Governor Deal was talking uh, well, about. Well, that, that, is, that is correct. It's not a shift in Republican politics. I think it's a great thing. All right, let's go to winners and losers. Darren, I'll go with you. All right, Mayor Bottoms, as I mentioned, oh, big win for, surprise. For, uh, for Super Bowl. But also, I want to uh, recognize Dan Corso. Uh, he's a man that actually has led the effort uh, when we had the Final Four, the National Championship. He was the uh, president of the host committee for the Super Bowl. He's also the, um, um, the president of the Atlanta Sports Council, so I want to make him a winner. I also want to make uh, Attorney General Chris Carr a winner. He came out this week and made a very, very bold statement about moving towards the effort to put the bell tower on top of Stone Mountain. So I want to uh, compliment him for that. And then lastly, Hammer and Hank Aaron turned 85 this week, and so yep. I want to wish him a happy birthday. You got it. <laughs> Phil, what do you have? Well, my winner is Gladys Knight, uh, when we were talking about the Super Bowl earlier. That was a wonderful rendition of the national anthem. Uh, I've got a loser, and that is the University System of Georgia Board of Regents. I think there is a glaring double standard between the punishments that are meted out to students as opposed to staff it has been about three weeks now since this warped uh, teaching assistant at the University of Georgia condoned the violence against white people. He hasn't even been put on administrative leave. Often students are expelled or removed within uh, 24 or 20, uh, 48 hours. And so I hope the Board of Regents finally does something uh, to this person. And uh, I guess finally, I have to say, uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is a loser because she still has not addressed the crime wave in the Buckhead business section of Atlanta. 
and uh, actually her own allies and city council are hoping that she'll address it. Well, there's time. Okay, Lori, <laughs> what do you have? Um, our Facebook followers are our big winners because I put out a post that, hey, I was struggling on winners and losers, and they weighed in. They told me who they thought won the State of the Union, who um, lost the State of the Union very loudly. Um, but um, Molly Faircloth and Diane Parks, thank you, because they also said Gladys Knight was a big winner from the Super Bowl. And Chad Carlson pointed out, we forgot to talk about this, that bridge to nowhere, because the bridge that was finished for in time for the Super Bowl at a cost of more than 20 some million dollars was not able to be used because the security folks thought it was a security risk. I still don't understand that. I, I really don't. Don't know why that bridge couldn't be open. But it, it could be opened at the end of the game. Yes, to let people but out. But not at the beginning of the game. not to let people in. Okay, well that's good. I, I was uh, amused seeing all well, the Well they let members of the media use it before, so I'm not <laughs> sure what that says. <laughs> media <laughs> purpose. <laughs> right, right, all right. Uh, for me, a big change at the, uh, uh, that should be acknowledged at the uh, Johnson Ferry Baptist Church in Marietta where the Reverend Brian Wright, as in right from my heart, is retiring. Uh, he's been a steady voice on the airways and the pulpit in Metro Atlanta for years. A very good man. And Super Bowl, those two little girls who sang America the Beautiful, yeah. Hallie and Chloe, mm -hmm. went to grammar school right in Dunwoody at Vandal. Oh, wow. They did a great job. They did. And we'll see you next week on the Georgia Gang. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program. 